Right, so um, what I kind of like to do with presentations is to start with a vague, with a, with a topic that may or may not be fairly specific and then just sort of start it through. We're not, we're not going to go through uh, every single rivet difference in all the different trials rifles. We're going to start with the general concept of the Swiss link, which really started with the, uh, the 1880s trials. And then uh, I have a time flexible presentation on various parallels and non-parallels between what happened in Switzerland, bolt action rifle development. Uh, and why. And I'm working on the basis that, uh, that most of you know relatively in depth the whole Lee Metford, Lee Enfield, short magazine Lee Enfield number four story. So I'm working on the basis that the Swiss side of that is less well known to you. I've got a few interesting parallels on there. Uh, not necessarily massive detail, hopefully at least vaguely interesting. So I'm Mike of Bloke on the Range. We founded the channel three years ago. We had, uh, well, I had a burning desire to make exactly two videos. Uh, one on the ergonomics um, of why Lee Enfield rifles are fast, the ergonomic reasons, the mechanical reasons, and the other one on busting a couple of really annoying M1 Garand myths. And it just sort of spiraled from there. And three years later, um, an ex-work colleague who moved to Switzerland about the same time as me and I run the channel. We've got 77,000 subscribers, which is, pe people like watching my stuff, it's incredible. Uh, we do a lot of firearms technology, history, sports shooting, and we like going back to original sources. I was just discussing with Nick uh, at the start there about Mad Minute sources. And we like busting myths, often by demonstrating it, because you can discuss all you want, but it's much easier just to show, and then there's no, there's no question. Um, we try and do this both with historical things and with sort of firearms technology, that kind of thing, and uh, physics. So my personal Swiss connection, I uh, managed to happen into the world of the British Alpine Rifles in about 2001. In fact, that's where I met David. Um, haven't been out for a while. Uh, you should. <laughs> and uh, I arrived in Switzerland and decided that it was rather nice there. Not only was, was shooting seen as something healthy and positive and normal, it's the fourth biggest participation sport in Switzerland. Um, people walking down the road or riding a motorcycle with a full auto Sturmgewehr 90 over their backs, it doesn't bother anyone there, aside from in the big cities. Um, that was nice, it was clean, the trains ran on time, all of that. And it was kind of a life goal to move there and it took me, uh, an eight year detour via Holland, I finally moved there in 2011. And I'm a member of the SGHWR, Schweizerische Gesellschaft für Historische Waffen und Rüstungskunde, which basically translates as HBSA, also interested in materiel, more or less. Um, and I'm very grateful that uh, Chris sends me your journal. It's always a, a good read when that uh, lands in the letterbox. So thank you very much. And then he's invited me out here to uh, talk to you on this uh, topic. <coughs> so let's go to the state of play in 1879. This is probably the critical date here. And this, the second half of the 19th century was an incredibly fast paced period for, 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 for firearms development. I mean, we went from smoothbore percussion muskets to the magazine rifle in about a 40 year period. And it's not like today where this phone from two years ago is now obsolete. In general, technology didn't pr progress anywhere near as fast back there. But we went from uh, something that is, in the shooting world, a specialist interest to something that is fundamentally not massively different from a modern bolt-action rifle. Of course, modern ones are better materials, there's better designs, there's um, better ergonomics and so on. But fundamentally, by the time we get to the late 1880s, we have the modern bolt action rifle more or less in finished form. So state of play, the UK we have a single shot tipping bolt and it's often said that the UK missed a trick by not going to a bolt action. Um, there was massive scepticism on bolt action because in earlier trials in the 1860s if I remember rightly there was an out of battery firing uh, during a trial it's before people really worked out all the internal safeties to stop firing pins protruding and touching live primers when they really shouldn't. 
Um, and hence the UK converted muzzle loading rifle muskets to Snyders. Popular enough, they built more, and then they adopted a sort of last generation um, peak of single shot design with a tipping bolt. Germany went the other way, adopted a safe <laughs> um, bolt action rifle. The French, I didn't put one in, were on the Gras, a very similar rifle to, uh, to the Mauser. The US had their equivalent of the Schneider, so was essentially a muzzle loader with a, with a forward tilting rather than a side tilting tabatiere block and an external hammer. And the Swiss, neutral Switzerland, were miles ahead of the game because they had adopted a 12-shot tube repeating rifle as early as 1868. A little digression, there will be lots of these tonight. Um, Swiss designation dates can either be a design date, an adoption date, a date of a decision by the Federal Council, or any combination of these. So uh, this means that in, in more generalist sources like Wikipedia or some of the, the coffee table books, a lot of the uh, acceptance dates and in and out of service dates are completely nonsense for instance, um, and there'll be an example here, but the uh, Model 1868 Vetterli was then progressively improved uh, until the last one was the 78 slash 81, I think. Um, and, but it, it was fundamentally, it ended up being the same thing. I mean, these are, these are quite common on the UK market because they're section 58.2, so free, free to own. Um, what are they going for these days? Just out of interest. Oh, it's not that much more because when I left the UK, they were going for about 450. Um, is that the original rimfire version? That was rimfire. Yeah. Yeah. It's 10.4 by 38. 38 yeah. um, in Switzerland, people who have access to a range where they can shoot over 8mm caliber and have an interest in old firearms like this will convert them to centerfire, which you do that in the UK and it's section 1. So you've got to be pretty keen. Um, when I lived in Holland, there were quite a lot of them around converted to, uh, to centerfire because you could own them off ticket and you only had to have the ammunition on ticket. Uh, the cartridge stayed around uh, a long time afterwards uh, in a hunting form, 10.4 by 42. There's no change in the chamber. Um, this is a very pre-modern chamber in these. I don't know if any, you, Tim's laughing as if he slugged one. So wh what you've got in the chamber of these is you've got a shoulder and then it just it's just this long straight cone it's about that long i did a serasafe cast on a couple of them and uh, there's no shoulder at all it's just it just goes straight forward like that and they can they vary massively in uh, in groove diameter um, interestingly they started issuing um smokeless ammo for these in 1891 and they were first used in in military manoeuvres in 1891. I just randomly happened across a reference saying this year will be the first that we use the, the model. It's basically it's a three, the equivalent of a 300 odd grain 44 magnum load, which is certainly behind um, the Martini Henry load. It's slightly higher velocity, but uh, overall it's behind. But you've got 12 of them in a really clunky bolt. So let's just quickly uh, compare each side of the equation here. An old uh, plate of the inside of a, ma of a martini with its tipping bolt. There's no point in going into this in much detail because you all know it. So this, is this gets a bit more interesting from our perspective here. So what's interesting with the Vetterli system is that there's a long bolt body and at the rear, there's a locking collar with two lugs and a bolt handle. When you work the bolt, this part doesn't rotate, takes a round in, fires it, and then there's a uh, early Winchester type parallel lifter. Um, these are uh, cartridge overall length sensitive because the, uh, the magazine stop is part of the lifter. Um, and when the magazine is down, the, the, the stop for the next cartridge is the previous cartridge. And uh, people who've reloaded for these know that it can sometimes be a bit of a pest 
to get a bullet that's sufficiently long. Um, and in a center fire conversion, you want a flat nose as well. So that takes a bit of length off that has to be compensated for. Uh, there were various types of ammunition. Um, there were both grease groove and paper patched black powder. And then when they went nitro, they, uh, they were all paper patched and a slightly yellowy patch. And almost everything you see on the collector's ammunition market is the nitro stuff. Um, it's from a, from a user's perspective, because I'm primarily a sports shooter, it's an extremely clunky action. And the ejection is not enormously positive and it seems to rely to a certain degree on the rim of the next cartridge and, 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 and the lifter to get it, to get it out. There's, there's a hook with quite a big clearance on the top and it just not very positive. But uh, that was absolute state of the art in 1868 and for quite a while. Now, in warfare terms, and it's a bit of a cliche to cite this, is the third battle of the siege of Plevna, the 11th of September 18, 1877, gets cited an awful lot because in this particular engagement, uh, Russia and Turkey were fighting and uh, the Turks put riflemen with a mixture of arms in the front line. They had their martinis, specifically Peabody martinis, and 1866 Winchesters. And uh, as the story goes, the Russians advanced on the position, the Turks opened fire with the Peabodies, and when the Turks got within the range of the lever action 1866 Winchesters, they uh, let them have it. And uh, that kind of woke, woke the European militaries up to the idea that, ooh, this thing that we've been saying is, no, 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 uh, the soldiers will waste ammunition, which is a cliche that comes up an awful lot, but they really did think that over and over again. Um, but maybe this is something we need to look at, and then you get a bit of an arms race. Everyone trying to adopt a repeating rifle to get ahead because you don't want to end up in a situation where you've got a repeating rifle and the others don't. And this is a period in time where strategically the rifle is a much more important weapon on the battlefield uh, than, than it is today, and it was from, well, from about 1915 onwards. I mean, again, a bit of a cliche to say it, but uh, uh, in a sort of collector's historians group, we were, we were racking our brains to try and find an example of a rifle being strategically important, or particular rifle design or training being particularly important after the retreat from Mons in 1914. I'll just throw it open to the room here. Can anyone think of, of a, a rifle affecting a uh, or preventing a, a defeat or having some strategic effect after stopping the German advance, or slowing the German advance in, uh, in 1914. Right, that confirms it, we're right. <laughs> <laughs> so a very brief look at the trials. Um, this is quite well documented in uh, Ian Skenton's book, the, 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 Lee, the Lee Enfield story, so I won't go into it in uh, great detail. Um, it was sort of on and off from 1879, primarily the Machine Gun Committee, there was also another small arms committee, this sort of fiddled, dabbled around a bit until it became the point where they really needed to do something. Preference for Martini Henry cartridges, though various others were used and I mean either of the well either the four five uh, sorry um five seven seven four fifty or the four oh two martini they're not great cartridges for a magazine rifle. They really have far too much taper. They're optimized for a lever action, a single shot to to ease extraction. But there were plenty that were used used in forty five Gatling which is a bit straighter and will stack easier in a in a magazine. And so this first Swiss connection, <laughs> um, so this first Swiss connection was uh, Vettli rifles being presented in the first round of tests in 1880s, which will presumably have been the up to date 1878 version then. Um, there was a general rejection of tube magazines after a Winchester 1876 blew up in trials. So we've got a bit of deja vu from the previous single shot bolt action trials. When a rifle explodes like that, it tended to get the committee a bit, because they're dealing with new technology, is it safe? And they thought, well, no, it isn't. Um, and the Vesteles were excluded from consideration even though they were rimfire. So there, there is no risk of a chain detonation uh, in, a, in a tube magazine with rimfire because there is no bullet nose in contact with a primer. However, they just said, no, 
We're out with two magazines. Sorry. 1886 is a critical year. The French developed a practical smokeless powder for rifle use. Up to then it had really been limited to uh, the odd shotgun cartridge because it was just too vicious. I mean, the French word would be vif, which is a good, uh, uh, to br uh, brisant, brisant. Um, the French finally got it to work, tried to keep it extremely secret. I mean, penalties for keeping cartridges or, or, or uh, exporting cartridges. Of course, within minutes, everyone had found out they'd done this and everyone else was, wor was working on it. Uh, and then on the 2nd of December 1886, the Small Arms Committee examined a 298 inch, which is old money for 7.5 millimeter, so-called Rubini rifle. And I apologize for this being French style. My, my work computer won't let me change it. So, surprisingly, despite this being a pivotal moment in the trials, there is very, very little information out there about this rifle. There are very few photos. I said, Chris, on, on the test to see if there's anything at, at your guy's end. Uh, annoyingly, I saw a schematic online. And I thought, oh, that's great. When I need that again, I'll, I'll be able to find that back. Could I? Nope. Broadly, it's a Vetterli action with a Lee-type magazine. So, box. And at that, at that point, it would have been a, certainly a, a single-stack single box. There is these photos, which I'm for, sorry for the reproduction, in the Lee Enfield story, which show a Rubin rifle, with its proper name, with the horror bag that is the Bethel Burton Hopper magazine. And it still shocks me to this day that they seriously considered a side-mounted hopper, gravity-fed hopper, as a competitor for the modern box magazine, or, or the, the early version of the modern box magazine. But they even fitted them to, the, to a Rubin rifle for trials, and that, that particular rifle was made at Enfield, and I cannot find any more photos of it. I, I was in the Ruag Amotech Museum, and they have all kinds of prototypes from the Swiss trials of the era, not one of them. And the guy, the guy that runs the museum hadn't even heard of it. What's also interesting here, a little trivia, is it's got a sticky out bolt handle, whereas the, uh, the act actual Vetteles have a turned down bolt handle. So it was very, was very, very much ahead of its time. Now, these were the cartridges that were being played at Swiss side at the time. Number one is basically a uh, um, 10.4 by 38 necked down to take a 7.5 millimeter bullet. Number two, we'll see again on the next slide, or something very similar to it. This was one of Rubin's. Uh, well, that, that was one of Rubin's cartridges. That was one of his experiments, and this was very, very high velocity for the for the era. <coughs> this was Rubin's. Um, trick to avoid necking, for a reason we'll get onto in a minute. Um, this one's rimmed, and the bullet is fixed in the case with a bushing, a collar, a bushing, a ring. You can see the obvious flaw in this plan. We'll get onto that in a minute. Three is a rimless version of the same thing, and four is another variant. These two are very, very similar. British side, this was presented to the committee, rimless. That is the first generation trials 303, mitt ring, and that is an actual production, what you'd expect, that is a uh, black powder 303 Mark I cartridge. So that is the gentleman in question, that is Colonel Edward Rubin. Uh, this is a photograph taken from the display of a lot of his work. I could, I could spend all day just looking at all the obscure things he was working on there. Um, interestingly, it seems that his rimless cartridge was a reinvention because um, there's actually, and I th should have put it in the presentation, um, unless I did. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've been up since five your time. 
The, um, the rimless cartridge was actually first invented by the Winchester Company or someone working for the Winchester Company in the 1870s for a new product line that never came off. <coughs> um, and it's a modern rimless cartridge. I suspect that at the time the only documentation available on that will have been the American patent. And I don't think Rubin would have had access to that. I suspect it was independent reinvention because it's an obvious sensible thing to do when you want to stack rounds in a magazine. Um, unless you're the machine gun committee, when you think, if it's got no rim, how does a machine gun hold onto it? Hindsight. So he was born on the 17th of July, 1846, died aged 73, 6th of July, 1920, in the saddle. Uh, he was an artillery major and then colonel. Uh, from 1871 to 79, he was the adjunct of the Federal L Laboratory, so presumably the sort of two I see uh, in tune. And from 1879 to 1920, when he died, he was director. And he had massive influence uh, on ammunition everywhere. So this here is, or I believe to be, the first series of trials of full metal jacket ammunition. If you want to use the American terminology, uh, metal patched ammunition of the era. So this is his uh, nine millimeter test ammunition from 1882. This is how early we're talking about. And any, most of you reload, presumably. Yeah, you know how difficult it is forming cases with modern equipment. Now, imagine it's 1882 and you're not only drawing the cases and dealing with the metallurgy of the era, you're drawing the bullets, swaging the, drawing the bullet jacket, swaging the, uh, the core material in there. This is, this is non-trivial stuff going on there. And uh, that's how early it was, it was being done. But nothing came of it immediately. Next. Now that there is uh, three rounds of 7.5 millimeter revolver cartridge 1882. In fact, it's the 1886 model of the 1882 cartridge. So the Swiss adopted in uh, 1886 already FMJ handgun ammunition. And we're going to go down a little tangent here. Um, the revolver they adopted was, uh, it's, it's often reported in the literature as a Nagant type revolver, but it isn't. Um, it's basically, it's Colonel Schmidt, who we'll hear more of later, his modification of a, um, the French 1870, 1873 type system um, with an Aberdeen safety, which we like. We have, a, we have a, 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 a gate loader that blocks the hammer and the trigger. Um, these were adopted in 1882, initially with paper patched lead bullets. And can you imagine the hassle of, well, many hands make light work. And in, in, in the area you have your urchins rolling your paper patch ammunition. They were rolling them for, for Vetteles as well, but they were doing it for pistol ammunition. But uh, in 1886, we had, I'll go back to it, that cartridge adopted, which is quite an interesting one, because although it's FMJ, it's quite pre-modern. It's healed. It's dip lubed in wax and it's dipped lubed in wax, even though these were made in 1962, because it was black powder. Obviously, it was originally black powder, but they never changed it to nitro. And uh, we worked out why. A friend who works at RUAG was doing some, uh, some skip diving to see if there was any interesting literature being thrown out. And uh, he happened upon a folder, which was the minutes which are verbatim word for word minutes of a series of uh, commission meetings for the Pistol Commission in 1911 and 1912. Um, and their recommendations regarding sh the Parabellum pistol, the Luger pistols that they had then. But what struck me and what's relevant for today is that uh, one of the officers in this commission stated, uh, smokeless powder is not suitable for use in revolvers because bullets get stuck in the barrel.
not true except for them now if any if any people before the handgun ban or if anyone's got these on uh, on section 7 uh, have tried reloading for them if you reload a jacketed bullet a pure proper jacketed bullet rather than copper plated um, it goes fine with a full case of black powder and the original load is 11 11 grains of Swiss number one which is a full case the problem is if you try and load an equivalent nitro load the flash gap's quite wide the friction from the proper FMJ is quite high and they do indeed occasionally get stuck in the barrel so they were they were right um, actually reloading for them is pretty easy if you use uh, jacketed or uh, sorry um, copper plated or conventional lead bullets but uh, yeah anyone trying to load commercial FMJ in them with nitro has issues so what's also interesting about these is that they were in parallel with the parabellum pistol uh, here we have some target practice and then back in the day manually operated cameras that's not an 11 degree safety angle <laughs> Beasley would have a fit so here we've got some officers shooting 1882 revolvers and here we've got parabellum pistols and this is partly a function of the way the Swiss military is set up um, unlike the UK which had a volunteer army from a long way back the Swiss still have a militia system so you would do your recruit school age 20 you would be issued whatever weapon was current then and if you weren't re-equipped for one reason or another you you stuck with that so when uh, the Swiss adopted the model 1900 Parabellum that went with first priority to infantry officers and it took quite a while to permeate through the system such that all officers got it um, and that was about mid World War One at that point and uh, another tangent you often get coincidences date coincidences which then get reported in the literature um, with the revolvers there was a change from hard hard uh, hard rubber grips to wood that happened mid World War One due to material shortages Switzerland couldn't get the rubber from overseas but they got trees uh, it's sometimes reported that, uh, that the wood grip ones are non-officer models but it just so happened to be a complete coincidence that the, that the, the two things changed over at the same, at the same time um, they're surprisingly accurate revolvers I really enjoy shooting mine I've won some comp comps with it against people shooting uh, Lugers at BAR uh, in, in the classic uh, category but compared to a Smith & Wesson or a modern practically any modern revolver it's very old school very ancient the double action is kind of an afterthought it's not as bad as a Russian 1895 Nagant but it's yeah I have done the advancing man with it it's not fun <laughs> so 1886 again the French adopt um, that Bal M the uh, clip being later 1890s um, this is Rubin again Rub Rubin was flogging his idea all over the place so we get France adopting it in 1886 Germany adopts it in 1888 and we will come we'll come back to us in a minute what Rubin was also playing around with was all sorts of uh, very weird and wonderful experiments uh, in very small cartridges very small calibers so here we've got uh, various 5.8 millimeter cartridges and given the problems that we have with the P13 ammunition in the UK a significant time later I can't imagine the barrel life on them was anything other than trivial um, but he was involved with uh, with various experiments the uh, Mondragon is one that should be cited and that has a marvelous bit of esoterica as its ammunition or some of them do um, this is for the Mondragon straight pull and hopefully show you a bit better what's going on in there so this is a real build a better mousetrap straight pull made by SIG in Neuhausen uh, I believe the Mexicans um, but the ammunition is fascinating if we go back 
What we've got here is a long bullet of which you only see a little bit sticking out the end. The rear end is supported in a disc that acts as a piston. So when it fires, the bullet and the piston go forward. The piston gets stopped and the bullet carries on its merry way. And this is certainly an interesting way to deal with some of the problems with the aggressiveness of the early nitro powders. Um, in the, uh, the Swiss cartridge that was sort of parallel to the 303, we'll get on to in a minute, uh, the, the solution to that was actually to have a surprising amount, in modern terms, a surprising amount of air, air space over the top so that the initial, as it, as it ignites, uh, it's got some air to compress. It's, you, you, your pressure's not peaking like crazy. Here, the solution is that the powder chamber gets bigger. Does it do anything worthwhile? I guess not, because this is a... This is a bit of a dead end. I guess there's certain parallels to some of the, um, the piston, uh, Russian piston-driven silenced ammunition. I guess that would be the modern equivalent of this, but in terms of an internal fixing ring, and this must have just been a nightmare to produce. Just think of the number of m manufacturing steps, because you, you, okay, you've got to draw it parallel, and then you've got to fill it with powder. You, there's, a, there's a crimp line here so that this doesn't fall in, and then you've got to See, the, I have no idea how they, <coughs> whether they whether they seated the bullet after they've necked it or did they seat the bullet and then neck it, which doesn't seem sound. It's, he was uh, had some interesting ideas. There's no obvious truth on the one bullet. No, that's a that's a, a different one. There's so many variants of this. I, I picked two uh, obvious ones. This one probably he probably decided I don't need to crimp it or I can crimp it onto the bullet or there will be some reason. Um, so, coming back to our trials, uh, according to journalists, and we all know what journalists are like, so the Camperdown Chronicle in Australia reported on the 7th of May 1889 that the English army, not the British army, the English army, had adopted the Rubin rifle together with its ammunition. Okay. That's an interesting one. Um, just imagine what, uh, how many degrees of separation you get from Rubin's ammunition to, and we've adopted Rubin's ammunition and a new rifle to a journalist writing somewhere down in Australia that, uh, that we'd in fact adopted the Rubini rifle. Uh, and, uh, this is, it's not just journalists though. There is a certain MA thesis from King's I was wondering if anyone's eyebrows are going up here, if they've seen it. Um, apparently, according to a master's thesis from King's, the Swiss adopted the Rubini rifle in 1886. Who knew? Um, I, think, I think here is a, is a misreading of the, um, uh, the trials report written by Slade that appears in the Lee Enfield story, and uh, a bit of wishful thinking. Um, uh, doesn't stop you getting a masters. So back in reality, UK adopted the Lee Metford rifle in 1888, um, and uh, I won't go into too much detail. I'm giving this presentation again in German to the SGHWR, and I'll focus more on the British side of it and leave out more of the Swiss side. Um, it's, it's often reported in the literature that this was intended to be a black powder cartridge, but it wasn't. Um, it was cited for a non-existent, or the early ones were cited for a non-existent nitro cartridge because the black powder was just a stopgap because everyone was rushing to get something into, into production because you got the French in 1886. It, the Germans had adopted a black powder upgrade to the uh, 1871. They put tube, copper check type tube magazines on them in 1884. So they had a repeating rifle with black powder. You got the Austrians with an 1886 straight pull on block clip loaded, but black powder again. Um, everyone's playing catch up, basically. The Swiss adopt that, and you see the, a lot of these on the UK market still. Going rate? Going rate for them these days? Uh, between 600 and 1,000, depending on condition and matching the bonds. Ah. Um, I'll make you sad. We can get these for 
100 to 150 um, I've not been offered one of these for free yet, but I'm sure if I asked around, I could get one for free. Um, so this is probably the best rifle of that era. It's a bit long and it's a bit heavy, but it's straight pull, it's got a 12 shot magazine and it loads with frame stripper clips. UK missed a trick by not having stripper clip loading because the UK was adopting a single shot rifle with magazine, with magazine capability and the Americans made the same mistake even later in 1895 with the Krag. Um, this, they were thinking in terms of rapid fire. In the 1892 dated manual, there's time tests of, you can load this with 13 rounds because again, the idea of a cut off and keeping the magazine in reserve was uh, a big deal even for them. Something like 13 seconds, you could, you could put 13 rounds in, in the roll, 20 seconds. Um, and you can fire them off at actually quite an astounding rate for the era. Um, not entirely parallel. Adopted about the same time. Lee Metford was in production earlier. This is a nice example of, this, this was the adoption date and the decision date, but it didn't actually really get in production in more than a slack handful until 1891 and it started being issued out to the troops at that point. Um, the Swiss immediately adopted it smokeless. Again there's, a, there's an issue in the literature where it's reported as being semi-smokeless. This is not the case. I have fired original cartridges. Uh, it seems to be a mistranslation because there's two words in German for smokeless, one of which is rauchfrei, literally smokeless, and the other one, which is actually the more common one, is Rauchschwach, smoke weak. And presumably somebody without a good knowledge of German but a dictionary literally translated that at some point back in the day and it ended up in the literature as semi-smokeless. And it's all over the place and it triggers me massively whenever I see it online. UK, as I mentioned before, had an interim adoption of black powder while a suitable smokeless powder was being developed. Um, it just wasn't ready. They needed to get the rifle out in the hands of troops. The UK had a rather more active army than the Swiss, um, as you might imagine. Um, so that had to wait until 1891 for Cordite to be actually online. And I presume part of the difference is climactic and storage. Uh, the UK having uh, responsibilities from the frozen north to dry and hot deserts and and uh, hot and moist monsoon areas, you've got to be sure you're not going to uh, adopt a newfangled powder that is going to decompose on you and sweat nitroglycerin in the jungle. That would be bad. So we're on eight rounds, single loaded for the Lee Met, 12 shots, double six round charges, detachable with a cut off. And uh, it's a real, it's another build a better mousetrap mechanism. Um, it's not actually a cut off, it drops the whole magazine so that the, the, the top round doesn't get in the bolt way. It's, it's quite clever. Massively over-engineered. So the original load, the stopgap load, 215 grain round nose, 71 and a half grain compressed pellet of, beet, of black powder. This was the reason for the fixing ring originally because you can't pour a single lump of black powder through a neck that's smaller. So. Uh, was formed basically like a 410, brass 410 shotgun cartridge, inserted into it with the pellet with its flash hole down it, and then crimped over the end. And the reason for the change was that uh, on a range day, a few empty cases without the fixing ring were discovered. That was a big oops. And they discovered that yes, they'd been coming loose and bulging barrels. So very quickly that was, but it seems that Ruben had already solved that problem anyway. So interesting point on the subject of compressed charges. The Swiss experience of the, of the compressed charges was that, um, sorry, what's the words? So the Swiss found that the gas pressure was too high and the smoke and flash and noise was too high. They didn't 
they didn't like that. The Brits adopted it as a stopgap. The Swiss tried it and said, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing that. Uh, loose powder to try and get the velocity would have meant a far too big cartridge. So they also went looking for alternatives. Uh, they tried different types of nitrate, but that just, well, aside from potassium nitrate, they're all horrifically hygroscopic. They just attract moisture and go, go horrible. And they even tried pick rates, uh, which are nasty explosive. So that didn't seem to go very well. But uh, by 1887, that they had, they had um, a workable powder, nitro powder. So really quickly after the French, I mean the French adopted this in 1886. It leaked immediately, despite the huge penalties for leaking it. And a year later, we've got tests, and then we've got an, uh, a composition called PC88 which uh, was loaded up to the end of production of that cartridge in 1912. It stayed the same and uh, it is in fact here. That is the Swiss cartridge and that powder looks just like Vitivuri. It doesn't smell like Vitivuri but it looks like it. It's, it's a cut tubular modern powder, 31 grains which fills the case up to about here. You, you, you go on a reloading forum and say, I've got a 60% fill, people s start talking about detonation and things like that, but no. Um, modern cartridges, the later GP11 are filled up to, up to here. And the Swiss, however, didn't adopt an FMJ, despite it being invented there. They adopted this oddity. It's a uh, nickel plated steel capped, it's a part jacket, healed, super soft lead. I mean, it sways, you can, you can dig into it with your thumbnail. Paper patched. And uh, for those who like their facts and figures, that there is uh, 0.315 of an inch, paper patched to 0.321. Which we then squeeze down a hole that is somewhere between 303 and 310. Uh, reloading for these is quite interesting. They are designed there's a sort of symbiotic relationship between that odd bullet and um, odd rifling. They're very, very tight. They're a true 7.5 across the lands. So three groove, equal lands and grooves. Um, and again, there's no, well, there's hardly no, no step at the front of the chamber. It's another sort of conical bore, uh, conical throat. And when these are in there, it just sort of traces down. They are a nightmare to reload for as a result. And because they're so tight, um, I've, had, uh, I've had cases where the, the bullets sort of vaporizing, I'm getting lead deposited on, on the muzzle trying to load uh, cast, or you've got to go on the side. Oh, it's a, not obvious. Metford, seven groove. I'm just keeping track of time, so you know about that. Let's move on. Um, another parallel, both of these rifles were rushed into service. Um, there's a whole series of changes in the Lee Metford, the big one being the change in the rifling profile in 1895. Do we have a safety catch? Don't we have a safety catch? Where do we have the safety catch if we have it? Sites, Lewis sites, barley corn sites, um, <coughs> screwing around clearing rod, things, li things like that. The Swiss didn't muck about quite so much, but then their rifles were only being used on exercise and in shooting ranges, not being used on active service. So certain problems wouldn't appear. However, in 1897, there is a, sorry, 1896, sorry, there is quite a massive change that goes beyond anything adopted in the whole Lee series in British service. Because fundamentally, if you look at a Lee, Lee Metford Mark 1 bolt and the sort of the basic configuration of the receiver, that core of the system stays. There's various minor geometry changes. Well, going, going to the number four, there's a geometry change there slightly, but it's relatively minor. The core of the system had no issues. The Swiss, that's the 1889 bolt, it's got the, if you think back to the Vetterli, you've got a long non-rotating bolt body, and then this is basically an uprod driven Vetterli. 
And it's kind of odd because if you were to make a straight pull from scratch, I want a rotating straight pull bolt, you end up with something like the M95 Manlicker or a Ross. It's the logical thing to do, nice and compact. Here, they, uh, they started from a Vetterli and there are in fact some uh, prototypes that are literally that, they are a mechanized Vetterli. So you've got a, an op rod that runs in a, in a channel in the receiver and a helix groove rotates that bolt sleeve and so on. But what they found was that whenever you had a bore blockage of some description, people leaving cleaning patches and that kind of thing, they had a nasty tendency to blow up. So um, what they did was they thought, okay, right, we'll move the locking lugs further forward so there'll be less bounce in the, in the bolt. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. That solved it. Easy change, right? We can convert the rifles even. <laughs> nope. Uh, this is rather trivial. Getting Schmidt to work on this was impossible. It was his baby. It was perfect. No, it's not possible to move the lugs there. So someone else had to do it. Apparently Schmidt was uh, a bit of a stick in the mud about this because someone was playing with his baby. You see my video on this though. Make a bit of a joke about that. This also ends up with changes on the receiver because uh, I have one of each. So that's the 1889. You move the bolt lugs forward, that actually changes a lot of the geometry in here and we end up with a receiver that's exactly 20 millimeters shorter. And then the op rod channel ends up being longer and it's a actually fairly substantial change. The basic operating principle remains the same. It's, it's still an op rod operated Vetterli type bolt but that's a huge redesign um, another little aside all they did with the changeover I mean, you think of the, in, in the British situation with a, um, uh, a standing army right okay this unit got these guns and another unit will get the new ones not so in Switzerland because you got presented your rifle at your recruit school age 20 it, just, it was just after a certain date, these rifles stopped being produced, these rifles started to be produced. And, one, and uh, this, looking at the production figures, it seems that half of, half of these were issued out and the other half went into store, into Canton arsenals. And after a certain date, people just started getting these issued out. So in the units, you'd have a mixture of old pattern and new pattern. They did this several times. There's a little bit of uh, textbook of small arms confusion. Um, there are a whole other series pre-modern FMJ ammunition. Uh, this is my favourite one in the series, it's the uh, Model 1900 short rifle, uh, which was issued to fortifications troops, engineers, that kind of thing. But in the textbook because small arms um, 1929, it's listed as the Swiss Schmidt Rubin. By 1929, there were zero of these in the system um, because they'd all been upgraded and converted. And when I was discussing this with Tim a moment ago, I remember that I had on my camera some footage ooh, are we, that way, that way, of <coughs> last Friday. I ought to turn the volume up. So that is a friend's back converted 1900 short rifle. So that, ri that particular rifle started life as a model 1900, was converted, was upgraded to a K00 slash 11, I'll show you in a minute. And then at some point after it left service, someone converted it back. And the ammunition we're shooting is 1910 head stamped and all that's been done to it is the primers have been replaced because the Swiss went over to um, non-corrosive primers quite early and it's 109 years old, they tend not to go bang. And you'll note that it is totally, whoop, I miscounted, it's completely smokeless. 31 grains of PC-88 is as smokeless as modern smokeless. 
and excuse me while I fiddle with the camera not bad off hand at uh, at 300 meters hang on I'll just uh, uh, that's 45 centimeters wide 40 centimeters high for reference um, that was a privilege to be able to to shoot that um, he won't sell it to me <laughs> don't blame him <laughs> what would you pay for it too much <laughs> Yeah, I've mortgaged the children already. For um, they, the, the, they, they do come up, the, the back conversions come up occasionally at auction, often with a reserve of about 500 or so. Um, original originals, there are a slack handful. There are a number, a few hundred that escaped conversion, but a lot of those will have been rifles that have been scrapped because someone used it as a bench seat in a train on their way to their repeat, repeat course or something, um, or blew up. So uh, there we go. So we've got a little bit of time. This is, this is the elastic bit of the presentation. I can go through this quickly or not. Um, 1898, France introduces a monolithic brass slash bronze um, solid boat tail bullet and no one except the Germans who paid the slightest bit of attention at that point. 1903 Germany develops... Why did they drop that? The brass bullet? Why did they adopt it? No, why did they drop it? They didn't. They stuck with it? They stuck with that until the end of... Uh, or or Bal N might be FMJ. Ball N is FMJ. Yeah, so that was much later. No, it was cost, I believe. Probably. Um, they were swaged. And we shot some originals. Um, what are known as uh, Bal de la Forêt, Bullets of the Forest. We were picked up from arms caches hidden various places. Um, and they also did something a bit insane, which was at the back, they uh, stamped a maker's code. And you often see the stamping cutting the uh, cutting the edge that can't have been good for accuracy uh, Germany adopts flat base FMJ boat tail sometime around 1903 now everyone's paying attention because uh, if if Germany's uh, paying attention everyone is and then everyone else quickly gets the idea the US goes there in 1906 Russia 08 ahead of us UK 1910 Switzerland 1911 first Full metal jacket boat tail, and even the, Sp the Spanish get in on it in 1913. And it's often a myth uh, that the Boer Mausers in seven millimeter were FMJ, well, were, were Spitzer. They weren't. So Britain adopts 303 Mark Seven. Switzerland starts tests from 1905. Um, here we have the GP90 we'd already spoken about, paper patched, a flat base similar to the German one, and then a boat tail. And that's Rubin again, playing around with that. Britain ends up with 303 Mark Seven. Shame nobody's making reproduction bullets because the modern stuff's nowhere near as good. Switzerland adopts GP11 about the same, about the same time. And uh, here's a few nice examples of it. and. Uh, this is from the, uh, one of the British military research institutions. They were studying it deeply. Um, the basic bullet design changed in small details. The original one is that. It looks like a match bullet. I mean, it, it, it's, it's made from the back. It's open at the back, but there's no crimp groove. I mean, the Swiss were accuracy junkies in a way you would not imagine. Um, later it got a crimp groove and they got some fairly hefty crimps, particularly once, once uh, we're starting to fire, fire it in um, guns that are harder on the, on the cartridge when being fed than a Maxim, because Maxim's soft, 
with this block doing that. That's a modern diagram of the modern bullet. And uh, I often get people sending me direct messages online saying, is it safe to load a 308 diameter bullet in a 7.5 Swiss? To which the answer is, that's 7.82 millimeters, which if you type that into your calculator is 308. So the Swiss were doing it, so yeah. So the cartridge got new converted rifles to go along with it. Um, long rifles for the infantry and short rifles for everyone else. And ultimately even the infantry was something like two fifths of the infantry. If, if they had any other job, they got one of them. Um, they down converted model 1900s and 1905 cavalry carbines to them. Uh, and these stayed in service you see you you only start to see privatization dates because the uh, the swiss soldier could take a rifle home at the end of his service there's a myth that it's his rifle in uh, certain periods it was his rifle in other periods it was no we need to recycle that through the system you get this old one or when he when he, when he went into the oldest age class because the swiss <coughs> army was organized in th in three age classes you might want to consider think of them as first line second line third line and third line has an overlap with the role of the British Home Guard as old gentlemen on, on, on bicycles suitable for point, point defence. Um, for quite a long, long time, they were re-equipped with the old 1889 rifles because there were bucket loads of them in store. Because when, when the 1911 pattern rifles went in, well, half, about half of the 1889s had stayed in store and never went out. All the rest, um, Came, uh, came back in, sorry, screwed that up. So at the, time, at the time of the conversion, anyone who had an 1889 had already gone into the, th the third, third line. Uh, the 89 96s were all brought in for conversion. Um, temporarily people were issued out 1889s. So uh, if you see 1914 era, uh, for photos of Swiss troops, they've often got 1889s because they were just exchanging them and then uh, from, uh, from a little bit further onwards they were then issued out the new rifles and then the 1889s came back in and then the Landsturm, which is the third line troops, got the 1889 rifles and they kept them until 1935 I think. Um, All that happened in the UK at the time was changing the profile of the sight bed. The rifle wasn't changed. So, slight aside, it gets back to the bullet. Um, US forces in World War I were taught long range machine gunnery by the Brits and the French with Vickers and um, Hotchkiss machine guns. Um, the 1906, model 1906, 30 calibre firing tables, beyond a certain point they've been guesstimated and were miles off. And once they got the shiny new Browning 1917 machine guns, they found that they couldn't lay down barrages anywhere near where they could with the British or French equipment. Um, at the time, Hatcher, Julian Hatcher, was doing experiments with 100, 180 grain match bullets and they were actually done, uh, tests done with Swiss GP11 bullets in 3006 cases, and in Hatcher's notebook, again, sorry for the reproduction, uh, there's, they're doing long range tests with American cases with Swiss bullets. And on the basis of this, they, they then um, did their own tests on boat tail length and angle and came up with <coughs> caliber 30 M1, which is basically the same bullet weight as GP11 and um, 303 Mark 7 at a slightly higher velocity. Um, GP11 is doing about 2550, 2560, 303 is 2440. I think that's at 78 feet. I think all the British, one of you guys should know. Uh, I'm pretty sure that all the British instrumental readings are 78 feet, whereas the Americans back calculate it to the muzzle. Um, and uh, it pains me every time an American comment commentator says that 303 British is weak when their equivalent with the same bullet weight 
is only doing 160 feet per second more. Okay, but uh, anyway, it's just a thing. It's not. It's not a matter of national pride as to whether your Mozilla velocity is five or ten percent higher or lower. So, Brits did tests, Kynock in particular, with streamlined bullets, and uh, this is one based specifically says with streamlined bullet based on Swiss type. So everyone was uh, was being inspired by Rubin's work again, even in the uh, 1930s for uh, long range machine gunnery. And then 175 grain boat tail FMJ at 2550 feet per second. So it's basically a rimmed GP11 with a smaller case volume. Intended for long range fire. One of the myths around this being that it's not safe to fire it in a Lee Enfield. Um, but if anyone has a copy of pamphlet 11, small arms ammunition, I've been desperately trying to find one and I can't. I found a partial scan and the second half of the paragraph with this information in it is not on the scan. It crosses the page. It was frustrating. So a final interesting parallel, which we should just have time for, um, so around 1930, plus minus, we end up with the uh, number one Mark VI and number four Mark I trials rifles. The Swiss in the same period um, had a similar program. The idea was that they wanted a better, more accurate, cheaper rifle. More suited for modern manufacturing, because in both cases they were 1880s, 1890s designs optimized for the manufacturing of that era, which had moved on quite a lot by the late 20s, early 30s. Um, and some of the solutions are kind of similar. The big ones that, that are parallel in the two is a much heavier barrel with up pressure at the muzzle, which was an American invention. Uh, the Americans are the ones that finally worked out how to make light barrel shoot well and consistently. The Swiss did the same thing. Slightly differently though. So that, depending on which manual you're reading, from what period, it's either two to six or two to seven, three to seven pounds of up force with no contact with the top handgun. And I'm sure you've all come across at least one number four where there's contact against the top handguard and it just strings vertically as it heats up. The Swiss have one and a half kilos of up pressure, but then it's clamped by the top handguard, which is making a rod for their own back in, in that you've got three function critical parts that have to be in excellent alignment. But it's very similar in that it's got a, um, a muzzle bearing up there, just like that. Already said that. However, the number four's bolt, as I said before, is a minor change from a Lee Metford bolt, just really is the rail on the outside or, the, or on a hook. Here, we've got a total redesign. The principle remains the same, but this part here becomes a bolt sleeve that goes all the way up. You've still got this part, but it's shorter. The op rod is no longer lovingly hewn from solid steel, but is a fabricated, manufactured part. And this enables the action to be massively shorter. So there's a Model 11, and there's a K31, it's so even a little bit closer to the camera. What they wanted there was a rifle that was at least as accurate as the long Model 1911, but in the same overall package size of the, the short K11, um, and not significantly heavier than the K11. And they succeeded, and we shoot these in competition. Uh, today. They can't, they can't keep up with modern rifles, but against the, the semi-autos, they can. The target, compared to a target rifle, it's hopeless. Um, and I think we just, we need to be, need to be bringing, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's a good one. So, I will skip the last slide because I've practically said it anyway. Going back to the, you mentioned that the Germans went on to flat base bullets. Mm -hmm. Did the, they stay with flat base bullets? Um, they adopted um, a boat cell bullet 
196 grain per ton bullet during World War One for, for long-range machine gun ammo. Mm. And then in the 30s, they decided that they were standardising that for everything. Um, the, the cliche is that the, the Germans were very machine gun focused, and they were. Um, but uh, yeah, it's quite. I mean, if you've ever fired a Car 98K with a an equivalent to the the Spitzer Votel bullet, it's uh, it's punishing because it's they're lighter than the number four or an SMLE, and just yeah, almost 200 grains running about 25, 50 feet per second, if I remember rightly. Again, it's uh, that's a lot of them. So why did the British um, stick with flat base? Then? Um, because we <coughs> decided that we'd have machine gun machine gun ammo for machine guns and rifle ammo for rifle and <coughs> light machine guns. Um, there's also the issue of cordite wear. And the real reason they didn't want, well, one of the real reasons they didn't want people shooting Mark Eight is if you've got a very cordite worn throat because it doesn't set up like a flat base, um, it, it, they won't shoot straight. Yeah, too hard for my lovely. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure it'll shoot flat base fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked earlier about the Betterly uh, chamber. Mm -hmm. You had the same thing with the Albini Brendan, which is a conversion. Yeah. And the town I've been told by Brussels is that that was to accommodate black powder fouling. And that may have been the reason for the people who may have. Possibly. There's, there's such a massive variation though. I think part of it's 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 tolerancing. Um, I mean, it's a, it's certainly plausible. Um, but yeah, but it, I mean, Martini Henry chambers aren't like that. I mean, they're they're, they're generous. The Albini doesn't have a throat, does it? No, no. It goes straight straight down yeah. into the rifle. Yeah. Mm. As these but, the, but the body, uh, the, the the case is actually bottlenecked. Okay. Oh, is that the, the, the one where the shoulder blows out and it's fine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was the black powder yeah. powder, yeah. Um, I think it's just that they thought that was how you, how, you, uh, how you did it, and it took quite a while before people realised that you needed a shoulder and a, and a nice tight lead. But you also used to get the, yeah, just quite kind of the same way, you've got the uh, expansion chamber in the chest boat and in the drives as, as well. Mm. A lot of space to play with. The reasons why I'm not quite sure on the drive. Um, the expansion, the expansion chamber on the Shaspo is to, to generate a bit of back pressure to blow all the paper out. That's uh, which, uh, we need to do a video on that because uh, people ask why is it why has it got this tubey thing, and, it, and uh, it it just means that you can't end up with paper behind gas. So you've always got something. It's basically it's an eject, it's a paper ejector. With the, the um the, the Dreiser, the later Dreiser said the same thing. They mm. called it the Luftkammer, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, copy from the French. Yeah. I, I, I may have missed it, but what's the difference between the Swiss GP90 ammunition and the 9023 ammunition? 9023 is a conventional round nose FMJ. Yeah. Uh, that was made in 1923 and 24. We've not seen any head beyond 24. Um, and it was just to build stocks up for in case of war because they were still uh, the 1889 rifles were still in service with the Landstrom, the, the, the third line troops. Um, during World War II the majority of the ammunition in the system was uh, was still GP90 uh, or 1912 or earlier manufacture and I've got a book that says that explains about the ammunition and says that there are small quantities of jacketed ammunition of later manufacture and that's the entire reference to so you can like the 1923 can be shot in 1989. Yeah, you can actually shoot that in a in a 1911 as well. As well. Yeah. Whereas the GP90 won't fit. Right. The brass there are bullets. There are bullets. There are bullets. Yeah, just be swimming through the. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, dipsy. Just be looking through the 1885 um, British military rifle trials, mm. military rifle trials, and they had at least four speed loaders in there. Mm. And the end of the report are a dozen or more maybe 15 um, sections of the different rifles themselves. And I didn't realise that that was a Rubin in there. I've got some photographs of it. Please. I've got some photographs. Please. 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 Uh, the camera ran out of space ah. at the end of it. But I will copy what I've, I'll check what I've got for you. Thanks. That would be super. Yeah.
Um, so the missing comment, link. The yeah. other comment in there is that they talked about the, the rim fire round of the, of the better leaf, yeah. the 800 cars, which they considered inherently unsafe being rim fire. I forget which for one dropping For dropping on hard surfaces or? I don't know. Mm. It was just one paragraph um, um, comment from someone on the Lens World's committee now. I can check back and tell you which one oh, I was. Well, yes, <laughs> certainly. Um, I mean, if if uh, my my colleague was here, he would probably be able to better answer it because he's uh, he's much more up well, on the, the brass alloy. Brass is an alloy. Mm -hmm. Brass is an no, alloy, but not, not with something different. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that they're just yeah, they're, they're, they're architectural. What, what what the British refer to is architectural bronze, which was a 1910. Um, alloy yeah. uh, with no lead at all in it, but, so it would have been mm. quite difficult to machine. Yeah. Uh, but that's why very often you see it reported as bronze, <coughs> bronze yeah. that particular type of brass was called architectural yeah. bronze. But technically it's not bronze. Is the <laughs> one. Uh, 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 it <laughs> was there any, any evidence of actual dialogue between our people and their people on these matters, or did we merely get signed to their stuff? Ruben, Ruben, was, like, Ruben, Ruben was, was involved, I mean he was pushing his ammo. Kent to the UK. Pretty sure. A uh, friend from BAR picked up an unhead stamp 303 in a random box of bits, of random ammo bits, in a gun shop in Toonal Burn and reckons he pick, picked up one of the early uh, Swiss produced, Toon produced trials 303 cartridges. Mm. I think it's. But uh, this is going back a while. In terms of what you were saying about the charger loading, obviously on the Metford, originally it had two magazines. Yeah. So they would know, having charger loading and the magazine, the magazine was intended to be cycled through, even though they yeah. abandoned them very quickly. Very quickly. I mean, like, within five minutes. Of, yeah. uh, it was really quick. What's <coughs> interesting, though, is that the, uh, uh, the US Navy adopted the Remington Lee in relatively small amounts, and there's even cartridge belts with, like, four or five magazine patches. They were, they were issuing out multiple uh, multiple magazines while we had one change to the rifle so then when you change when you swapped it out for the second one you've got one dangling underneath <laughs> which can't have been good for the magnets um, that was bizarre issuing briefly issuing two mags but having one chain to the rifle it's also they actually had modified the magazine to the lips were more suitable to be loaded while in the body yes because the mark one method you have to push the round in base first and rotate it around if you watch um, British Muzzle Loaders the channel, he has a uh, he's gone through all the drill mo movements of this in great in great detail. It's fascinating. And interestingly, his has an Enfield barrel on it because when the when the Mark One Metfords wore out, because they kept in uh, uh, yeomanry units, and actually I believe some of the New Zealanders landed at Gallipoli with them. But if they were rebarreled uh, at a subsequent point. They, they were still called Mark One Magazine New Method. It was the, the, the Knox form was just had E, which is an interesting bit of trivia. Well, I guess we'd better wrap up at that point. Yeah. We'll take the magazine. So, Mike, thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed talking to us and some questions and interchange. Thank you very much. Thank you.